Hi, it's Dave T here with episode six of my off-grid power mini-series for people looking at camping or caravanning without an electric hookup. In this episode, I'm going to look at solar power as a means of generating your own electricity whilst camping off-grid. Solar power is a very broad topic, so to keep things as simple as possible, I'm going to concentrate on the main types of panels and solar charge controllers available for caravans and motorhomes. Using solar panels coupled with some form of leisure battery is one of the best ways to ensure a supply of electrical power when camping off-grid. Large capacity batteries are a good option if you are planning short trips of a couple of nights, but ultimately there is only so much power that you can take with you. For those of you that have had a chance to play with my spreadsheet I created in my calculating off-grid power usage video, you will no doubt have seen that having more solar power has the greatest effect in delaying the point at which your power runs out. So with that in mind, let's look at the main component of an off-grid solar power solution, which comprises of solar panels, some form of charge controller, a battery, and of course not forgetting suitable cables to connect them safely together. There are several different types of solar panel technologies, but by far the most common types for leisure use are monocrystalline and polycrystalline. Monocrystalline are the more expensive, but tend to be more efficient and therefore smaller for a given wattage, which generally makes them the most common choice for caravans and motorhomes. They are available in both rigid and flexible formats, with the rigid versions again being the most commonly used, but flexible panels are useful if fitted, particularly if fitting to a curved roof such as a boat. Panels can be mounted either directly to the vehicle roof or used as standalone products placed on the ground nearby. Roof mounted units have the benefit of being more secure, less hassle to set up on site, and of course will provide power whenever the sun is shining, so perfect for keeping batteries topped off whilst in storage, where a freestanding panel is likely to be packed away. Ground mounted panels are more at risk of theft or damage, but do have the advantage of being movable throughout the day to catch the best angle for the sun. You should note, however, that they are also more likely to be incorrectly directed at some parts of the day, if not moved, since they are typically used in a semi-vertical position. There are two ways to connect multiple solar panels into a system, series and parallel. When connecting in parallel, the voltage is based on the voltage of the lowest panel and the current is based on the total of each panel's maximum current added together. When connecting in series, the voltage is based on the sum of each panel's voltage and the current is then based on the lowest panel's current. As you can see, mixing panels with different ratings may adversely affect either the voltage or the current. Since the power is determined by volts multiplied by current, the result for matched panels should be similar in either configuration. If you are forced to add mismatched panels into an existing system, then you may find that one configuration gives you better results. In theory, parallel is also more tolerant of faults so that an issue with one panel does not affect the entire array. But series connection does provide some advantages for other situations, such as in high power configurations and where the reduced current allows for longer runs with lower gauge cables. There are mixed opinions on which is better, so I'm just not going to make a recommendation here. However, what is certain is that with either approach, you must ensure that both your cabling and controller are able to handle the additional current if wiring in parallel. For series, the controller in particular must be capable of handling the higher voltage as well as the current. Combinations of series and parallel are also possible, but much less likely in a typical caravan or motorhome installation. The cables used for connecting your solar panel systems are often overlooked, but for reliability and safety you must ensure that they are of the correct gauge, that's thickness, and also quality. You should also use flexible cable that is rated for outdoor use. You should never use cable designed for domestic mains cabling because that type of cable is generally much more rigid and with the exception of very high current ratings, it's almost always single core. This is prone to breaking when flexed and so is not suitable for caravans or motorhomes which will be moving and bouncing around. The gauge of the wire is based on the current that it is carrying, not the total power. So as we saw in the electrical theory made easy video, with low voltage systems, the current must increase to get the same power. 
This is why, for example, a 12 volt 200 watt light will require heavier cables than its domestic 240 volt equivalent. As we all know, the strength of the sun changes according to the season, time of day, and perhaps most obviously the weather. For this reason, a solar panel's power output changes almost constantly, and so it would be inefficient and often actually unsafe to connect a solar panel directly to any device that requires power. In some situations, the current draw of the device would be too much for the panel, and in others, the panel's voltage would be too great for the device. For this reason, in almost every application, solar panels need to be used in conjunction with a rechargeable battery. The battery acts as a buffer, providing all of the current that the device requires at a reasonably stable voltage, and then is replenished by the solar panel. Connecting a solar panel directly to a battery is also a bad idea since batteries need to be charged at specific voltages to avoid damaging them. So to resolve these conflicts, a solar charge controller is required. This is connected in between the solar panel and the battery and controls the voltage and current used to charge it. Most controllers also have a load connection, but it is worth noting that this will actually still be drawing current from the battery, and in most caravan and motorhome installations, this is not actually generally used. The main purposes of a solar charge controller are to block reverse current, prevent overcharging, prevent overload, disconnect on low voltage, control charging based on battery types, control charging based on temperature, and display and meter voltages. There are two principal types of solar controller technology, PWM and MPPT. PWM controllers are less expensive than the equivalent MPPT controller and provide the basic requirement of controlling the voltage supplied to the battery or load. They are generally less efficient than MPPT controllers, especially in overcast or cloudy environments. It should be pointed out that MPPT technology is related to optimizing the output of a solar panel as opposed to a charging technology. In fact, there are solar panels available which incorporate MPPT control circuits within the panel unit itself. How MPPT works is actually quite complex and I'll put a link in the description below to some good videos that explain it. But for now, here is a hopefully simple explanation. The electrical characteristics of any given solar panel, such as its resistance, current and voltage, are all variable. This is because the input, the sun, is variable and other changeable factors, such as the panel temperature, also affect its performance. This means that when a solar panel forms part of a circuit, it is almost impossible to balance the components by design. One way to consider how an MPPT controller works is to consider the ABS system on a car which adjusts the braking force to match the variable and unknown characteristics of the road surface. In a similar way, an MPPT controller monitors the characteristics of both the load and the panel to balance them, primarily by introducing an appropriate additional resistance. As the additional resistance then affects the panel's output, it is again adjusted to find the perfect balance. The constant monitoring is how these controllers get their name of maximum power point tracking and is why they can be up to 25% more efficient at gathering power in certain situations, particularly such as poor weather where we have here in, that we have in here in the UK. Apart from the core technology, there are several other things to be considered when looking at solar charge controllers. Before you consider anything else, when looking at charge controllers, you should work out the power rating and input voltage that you require. This is generally determined by the number of solar panels that you either have right now or intend to have in the future. If you intend to connect your solar panels in series, then the input voltage will increase. With parallel wired panels, then the current is increased. Either way, you need to check that both your controller and also the wiring can safely handle the current and voltages. Possibly the second most important difference between solar charge controllers is their ability to accommodate different charging profiles for batteries. Basic low cost controllers are typically designed for standard wet lead acid batteries with a simple charge cycle aimed at those battery types. If you are using more exotic battery types such as AGMs, gels or lithiums, then choosing a more advanced controller with the option to adjust charging profiles will likely prolong the life of your battery and also ensure that the maximum use is made of available solar power. 
If you have a dual battery configuration, then some controllers such as this one from Truma have two battery charge outputs. Also, some controllers have provision for temperature sensors to modify or even halt the charging process based on the battery temperature. One thing that is often overlooked when choosing a solar controller is usability. They are often viewed as fit and forget type devices where little or no interaction is required. This is generally true. However, even the most basic controllers can have features which, for example, cut off current to the battery if certain conditions are met. When situations like this arise, then a controller that gives clear indication of what is happening on an LCD screen rather than via a series of different blinking LEDs can, well, let's just say it can make things less stressful. Most caravans and motorhomes provide some form of voltmeter to measure the voltage of the leisure battery to determine the remaining capacity. Unfortunately, this has several limitations. Firstly, voltage is affected by the load currently placed on the battery. A battery with no load will tend to give a higher reading. Similarly, when charging, the voltage is raised, adding further confusion. Some solar chargers, such as the EP Ever ViewStar controller shown here, have a battery level indicator which takes other aspects into account to give a more accurate indication of battery state. More complex smart chargers, such as the Victron, take this further by logging data so that a complete history of energy collection, voltage and various other factors can be viewed. Determining how much solar power you require is a very difficult question to answer, but I found that the best way to think about the problem is to consider the solar panels as being a way to replenish your power banks. When thought about this way, then your expected usage becomes much easier to put into context. For example, if you typically stay off grid for just a few nights at a time, then the solar panels only need to replenish your batteries enough to enable you to reach the end of your trip. Any deficit will of course build up, but hopefully not before you head home. If on the other hand you typically stay for one or more weeks at a time, then you really need to ensure that your solar panels will be able to fully recharge your batteries. In other words, they need to pretty much put back in whatever you take out. Speaking of what you take out, it stands to reason that if you use a lot of electrical power, then you will either have limited nights per trip or must add more solar power to either partly or fully replenish the batteries. The next thing to consider is the time of year in which you will be camping. Solar panels in the winter can give as little as 10% of the power that they would produce during the summer. If you plan long stays away during the autumn and winter, then you will need to scale up your solar panel capacity accordingly. From personal experience, we have had frequent three or four night trips away off grid throughout the camping season with just a 60 watt panel and a standard leisure battery. We have also had several longer summer holidays off grid with the same setup. But of course, our power usage could be completely different from yours. The one thing that is fairly certain is that if you are looking at fitting solar panels for the first time, then the difference in cost between different size panels is not enormous. So if finances allow, it makes sense to have larger panels and choose a controller that also gives you some scope for adding more later. I hope you found this video helpful and if you have then please hit that like button and if you are interested in seeing other videos that I make then please consider subscribing to my channel. But most of all, thanks for watching.